This week, we're looking at your health. AI is listening to your breath. An electric headset is treating depression. And the robots are in theatre. Hey, welcome to Click. Hope you're doing okay. Now we're recording this on Wednesday. By the time you see it, England will be in its second lockdown. So I've just been out to get my emergency pre-lockdown haircut. Yes, and I need to get my roots done before midnight, so we'd better hurry up. <laughs> and then I guess over the coming weeks, well, we'll be back to this. I guess so, I guess so. So although lockdown is an inconvenience for some and a financial crisis for many, there are those people whose medical conditions make the coronavirus even more dangerous. Take cystic fibrosis. Now, this is an inherited condition that affects around 11,000 people in the UK. It causes a, a thick, sticky mucus to build up in the lungs and the digestive system. Recently, the Cystic Fibrosis Trust, the University of Cambridge, Microsoft and the Royal Papworth Hospital have teamed up to create Project Breathe. It's a remote monitoring platform that uses artificial intelligence. Due to the pandemic, the project has sped up. Originally, it had 97 patients, but by the end of this year, it's expected to have 500. <laughs> We went to visit Sammy Reed to hear about her experience with the project. Sammy was two years old when she was diagnosed with CF and was one of Project Breathe's earliest participants. Before I got involved with uh, Project Breathe, I didn't know what artificial intelligence was. I had no idea. So I used these pieces of equipment to um, upload all my data automatically to my phone. They then are um, number crunched through the AI system and then they obviously deal with everything that I have inputted over the last 365 days. Trends in that are obviously then um, analysed and then they are then forwarded on to the relevant person. The equipment is used to monitor key indicators such as lung function and oxygen saturation, which are automatically compiled and tracked via an app. The AI is used to recognise patterns and predicts any decline in health early. It then alerts an individual when they need to go for a checkup. Those living with CF usually have to attend a clinic every six weeks, even if they're well. That results in a huge number of wasted days for people, disrupting their lives and putting them at risk of infection. The artificial intelligence within this monitors my data input and it can see trends so it can see for example um, when I'm likely to pick up an um, infection looking forward um, when for example they can see 11 days in advance within the trends that you know you, you, you are likely to be going downhill so they can pick that up quicker which means I can treat myself quicker which means that I'm not then obviously um, admitted as an inpatient. Attending a clinic every six weeks also means that relatively little data is collected, both on the individual and across all of those living with CF. But now, eight or nine pieces of data can be captured at home every day of the year. We are finding artificial intelligence really interesting. I'm finding it that how can something so simple as uploading some data mean that it can save me time, it can save the NHS time, it can save my consultant time, but it's everything is just moving forward. And I just think that it's such a wonderful thing that we can, you know, obviously input something that takes five minutes that is gonna then, you know, increase everyone's chances of living longer. That was Sammy Reed. Now, AI is also being used in a groundbreaking study to try and identify the difference between COVID-19 and other dangerous lung conditions. Jen Copestake has been to find out more.
The ability to quickly diagnose health conditions is becoming more and more urgent as the coronavirus pandemic continues. There's a backlog of patients waiting for scans. Cancer Research UK estimates this is currently 3 million people. So doctors are increasingly looking to study how machine learning algorithms could process large amounts of data quickly with fewer human resources. At the Royal Marsden Hospital, a study is underway to develop an algorithm that can determine the difference between COVID-19 and the side effects of cancer treatment on a scan. These are things that are often very difficult for the human eye to determine. Okay, so this is a patient with coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. And essentially we have some CT scans of the chest that are taken a few weeks apart. Dr. Richard Lee is a consultant in respiratory medicine and a champion of early cancer diagnosis at the hospital. So on the, the left side here, um, we can see the patient has uh, the two lungs, which are usually black in colour, and we have this fluffy, greyer, kind of almost ground glass appearance at, at the bottom of the lung. And one of the things that we see in COVID-19 is this sort of ground glass change uh, that suggests infection or inflammation, but the same things can be seen in the context of how the cancer is behaving, and particularly important is, is how the treatment itself can cause a very similar change when, when there is toxicity. A large archive of anonymized clinical images is being used with approval from the hospital's ethics board. This data can be studied without inconveniencing the patients. Expert radiologists can make indications of things that are slightly more like the pattern of, of COVID-19 or more like the pattern of treatment toxicity. Obviously this is a new disease and we're trying to understand how, how much depth we can see in that subtlety uh, and the amount of information that we think we can extract using computer algorithms and analysis we think will be much more able to differentiate those changes and certainly to do so more quickly when we're under times of strain such as in a pandemic. One of the patients who gave permission for her scans to be used is Sarah Ward. Sarah was diagnosed with melanoma and has been receiving immunotherapy treatment for the last two years. Immunotherapy can cause toxicity to build up in the lungs which can damage them. I had um, issues with my lungs at the beginning and I was breathless. I was quite scared because they said that they could damage my lungs and they indicated that there was a possibility that I wouldn't be able to go back on the treatment. So I was quite relieved when they said that, yeah, I could go back on it and that there wasn't, any dam there wasn't damage to my lungs. This damage can present in a similar way to COVID, which is why her scans were selected. So I feel that if that helps um, future ca cancer patients and improves the care of cancer, especially in, in these COVID-19 times, then that's a good thing. I don't mind it, that a machine being used. Other ways algorithms are being used to help doctors during the pandemic include identifying COVID-positive patients through coughing. Researchers at MIT showed how they could use samples from tens of thousands of coughs to determine whether the cough was COVID-related. An algorithm picked up differences indecipherable to the human ear, identifying 98.5% of people who had the virus and were displaying symptoms, and 100% of people who were asymptomatic. With no immediate end to the current crisis in sight, finding ways of prioritizing treatment and diagnosis using AI will continue to increase. Hello and welcome to the week in tech. This was the week that while all eyes were on the US presidential election, gig economy companies like Uber, Lyft and DoorDash won a vote in California. That means freelance workers such as Uber drivers will continue to be classed as contractors, not employees. That same night, voters in Maine chose to ban the use of facial recognition by police and city agencies. If Google Meet is your video calling app of choice, you may be pleased to know they've just added virtual backgrounds like on Zoom, Skype and Microsoft Teams. Perfect for hiding your messy kitchen and just in time for those of us in England going back into lockdown. The makers of the Raspberry Pi computers have revealed a new model contained inside a keyboard, inspired by retro machines like the ZX Spectrum and BBC Micro. The company hopes the low-cost device will appeal to families who don't have a computer at home. Japanese fashion retailer Zozo is giving its spotty body measuring suit another world to help people buy clothes that fit online. 
The Zozo suit lets the wearer measure their body by standing in front of a smartphone camera. The original was criticised for giving inaccurate readings, but Zozo says the new suit is much more accurate. Okay, sorry to get this stuck in your head, but guess what's become the most watched video on YouTube? It's Baby Shark, the infuriatingly catchy children's song. It's now been watched more than 7 billion times, overtaking the previous record holder, Despacito, the pop hit by Louis Fonzi. Mike is 42. He works in tech and lives in West Sussex with his wife and five kids. He's also one of the 264 million people around the world who experience depression. I've had uh, depression for 15 years clinically, living day to day with mood swings and um, upsetting thoughts like of suicide. You can spend a week where you don't want to get out of bed in the morning. Sometimes when you're depressed, you just don't feel like talking. Over the past year, Mike has swapped traditional therapy for an app and an electricity-emitting headset. Today, only half of patients are accessing the treatment they need. But this setup could help them get immediate support without even leaving the house. Take these two little jobbers here. You then go type your hair, if you have any. Start the headset and then it connects over Bluetooth. I've got a big head, so it goes on. It fits me really nicely, actually. A weak current stimulates the part of the brain that's usually less active in those with depression. It's a weaker version of similar treatments already delivered by doctors in clinics. It just tickles just a little bit. There are pages of advice on sleep, exercise, nutrition and mindfulness. I sit back and relax or I go on the app. Close your eyes and direct your focus into your body. Focus on your breathing. The latest thing I did was an attention exercise and it was, um, it was a, a video to show me how to, uh, for mindfulness, how to calm myself and focus on my breathing. Try not to think about these thoughts as distracting. They're actually part of mindfulness practice. Most communication on the app goes through a chatbot. This encourages users to stick to sessions, suggest positive actions and records progress. I've done 25 hours of stimulation. It knows that I've done 63 of the chat sessions and uh, I can see on this treatment programme that there's a downward curve um, and a downward curve means that I'm feeling less depressed, um, which is really important obviously. When you're on your medication, um, you, you you don't know how you're doing, but with this treatment, you do. Things that, that have changed are, are fairly fundamental. Um, things like being, into, be, being able to engage with my children more, um, being able to get into my workshop and, um, and do things that I find relaxing. Being out of a depressive mood is uh, life-changing. What it does is, is that it makes it easier for the brain cells to fire or to discharge. And it's been looked at in thousands of people from around the world. I think this is a potential first line treatment for, for depression, um, and particularly for people who, who cannot take antidepressant medication or who might not want to take antidepressant medication or who don't want um, psychotherapy. That doesn't mean that the treatment comes without risk though. I'm concerned that people might um, just use this instead of getting, uh, having a, a proper assessment and getting proper help. How long you can use it for, how much you can, how often you can use it, long-term effects, all of that needs to be looked at some more. Even Flo's founders in Sweden accept their device won't work for everyone. It's the same for all treatments. Even as a clinical psychologist, I know that even up to 60% go out of, of the clinician's office uh, and, and haven't got an effect from, from CBT, for example. And we know that's true with, with antidepressants also. Flo is now running a clinical study to prove the efficacy of combining the app with the headset. But it's the app they believe will really keep users on course.
uh, many people they look at the headset and and think that this is the new thing but i think the, the chatbot is at least as important uh, the chatbot has many many functions so we want to be able to explain to the user that it's important that you follow the treatment protocol we want to be able to remind them about that to increase the efficacy but a headset app combo is not the only option for those who are struggling there are many other free clinically approved tools in the nhs apps library New this year, this one aims to help 10 to 18 year olds improve mental health with its floating AI driven chatbot. Let's get started. And remember, I'm here with you every step of the way. This one uses cognitive behavioural therapy to help those struggling with negative thoughts. Whilst these choose your own adventure games help instill useful emotional fitness skills. Apps like these have become increasingly popular in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. But although they may help, it's important to remember that they don't replace a medical professional. And if you feel that you need some support, you can go on the website below to see details of the help available. Now, while we've been spending more time at home, as well as movies and TV, many of us have been gaming more than we used to. In fact, the Click team are now having a weekly Among Us tournament every Friday. And Lara's wiping the floor with us most weeks. But as well as being a distraction from everything, there is one game which has actually been recruiting its community to help research COVID-19. EVE Online is one of the biggest multiplayer role-playing games out there with 300,000 monthly players. Set in space, you can be anyone, a fighter, a trader, or even a pirate. Whilst exploring the universe, players can also engage in a mini-game called Project Discovery, where they analyse cell clusters. Now, although it's just part of the game for them, they're actually sifting through real-world data for researchers who are examining how the coronavirus affects blood cells. It's a gamified version of a scientific technique called flow cytometry, which is used to measure physical characteristics of a population of cells or particles. So far, over 171,000 players have completed 47 million tasks, which amounts to 36 years of categorizing cells. Like, it's, you just, you look at a plot and you just draw polygons around data. You can just sit there, pull it up and start doing it. And I think that was exciting to me, just how approachable it was. You know, you hear about the COVID research or COVID going on all around the world. A lot of people like you know have had it or know someone who's had it and just the fact that I can sit here at my desk while I'm waiting for a fleet doing something that's going to contribute to you know helping find out information about COVID-19. The data generated by the players accelerates the scientists' ability to determine what's in the blood of COVID-19 patients. That information provides an insight into how our bodies react to the virus and how therapies that are being developed interact with both the coronavirus and our immune systems. And as players have been so successful at the data classification, they've been given even more complex tasks by the team behind the project. It's really just like citizen science to a T. We had a, a giant group of people and we made this fun. We, we gamified this quite a bit. There's incentives for people to do it that'll uh, boost their game experience, but it's also just the, the, the heart and soul of our community as well. These are things that our people really enjoy and this really is for the greater good. And that was the strength of this project in particular where this came out when everybody in the world was at its height of being affected of this. Okay, what we're gonna do, guys, we're gonna sit 10K off a target, we're gonna blap it really quick, and then we're gonna warp to the run spot. Does that make sense? Roger. Yep, yep. Outstanding. Okay, stand by. And it's not just about the bonuses for the players. EVE Online's community is keen to support the scientific effort in the fight against COVID-19. That's just phenomenal that I have this opportunity just playing a video game. And I think that's really kind of what got me into it is that 
I can sit at my desk in the comfort of my home and I can help researchers do something, you know, make a difference. And that's kind of cool. Triage carriers are going to jump, just the triage carriers are first. Everyone clear? How brilliant is that? Now, we're going to continue with our health theme and talk about surgery, specifically keyhole surgery. Now, this is something that can be quicker than normal surgery. It can cause less trauma and it can reduce recovery times. This kind of surgery can be carried out by remote controlled robots. It's just not that widely available. But Paul Carter has been to see a new type of robot surgeon that could change that. I'm certainly no stranger to scrubs. You can see the arms moving behind me and they almost look like they're moving independently. This US robot still dominates the market, but it's big, it's heavy, and costs nearly $2 million a pop. But now there's a new British bot on the block. This also aims to help patients heal quicker by performing complicated medical procedures through just a few access cuts. It turns out, stacking tiny blocks is perfect for surgeons in training. Today, only around a third of people who could have keyhole surgery actually get it. It's hoped this small mobile setup will make it more accessible. One of the differences with this design is that it's modular, which also makes it portable, meaning, in theory, even someone like me should be able to move it. Surgeons wear 3D glasses to improve depth perception, while controllers manipulate wristed arms for greater dexterity and precision. One of the troubles with a big robotic system is it occupies the theatre. When you're not doing robotic surgery, very often that theatre is then stands, stands empty. You could fold this up and move it to the theatre next door to colleague number two who wants to use it, honestly, in a few minutes. And there's no tremor because the instrument's taken that away from me. But anything you can give that reduces um, the physical strength. It's a win. Yeah. What's amazing is just the, the level of movement. It's like you're playing a, a Nintendo Switch. It looks, it looks uh, like a game, but, it, but it's, it's not a game. This is, this is absolutely. you know, it's, it, life and death, quite literally. I can get it exactly where I want it. And it's, it's, it's relatively effortless. Versius has completed more than a thousand operations this year, rolling into several NHS hospitals, including this one in Surrey. It's proving particularly useful amidst the coronavirus pandemic. This operating theatre we're only using because of COVID. We wouldn't be able to get the other robot that we use into this because it's just too tight. All these modules that you can see are much smaller, so we can move them during the operations. You're sort of only constrained by the number of units you can get around the table. But the robotic carts aren't just moved around the one room. Ultimately, long term, it'll also enable us to use the same robot between theatres so you get much more use out of one machine. In future, the devices could even be shared between completely different hospitals. Because the units are so small and can be packed up, um, we could put them on a truck and bring robotic surgery closer to patients rather than have them necessarily travel so far just to one centre. That's not just convenient, it could help relieve pressure on the NHS. Increasing keyhole surgery in this way could help reduce the risk from coronavirus not only to patients, but to medical staff too. That was Paul Carter. How amazing was that? I really feel like everything this week has been like super interesting. Yes, I've enjoyed it. <laughs> anyway, that is it from us for this week. As ever, throughout the week, you can find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. Bye bye.